Amen. It's great to see you today. Hey, uh, and happy Mother's Day. I was over in the, the Great Hall. We had lots of parental child dedications there celebrating our new, newest moms among us. But um, it's a great and wonderful day. My mom is here today, which is a rare moment uh, for me. And I don't even know where she is. She's over here. Okay, mom is right there. Mom, you can wave. She's right there. Um, because, listen, I... And I'm, I, I have lots of, I, I talk about mom often, and I have a lot of amazing moms uh, and women in my life, um, having raised, you know, twin girls and all, all the things. In fact, Emily is here, my daughter Emily, this is rare, from California with her husband Luke, who are here as well, sitting with, uh, with my mom, along with uh, Luke's family is here. And he, had, he grew up in a sorority with three girls um, in his life. But amazing, amazing moms. Some of you know John, Nona, uh, Lander. Stacy is serving in the um, preschool area, which she does every week at this hour, so that other young moms, moms can be in worship during this hour. And just, I'm surrounded by amazing women in my life. And we're going to look at an amazing woman uh, today. But mom, I'm so glad you're here today. I praise God for you, your influence in my life. And she hears my sermons every week. Can you imagine that? And she's here now in person. So no pressure on me at all today. Um, but she's my, really in many ways, my number one encourager in my life. Now, before I begin, I want to say a word to all of our women, girls who are here today. All that's being said about women today, I want to, I want to offer this to us all. Um, God has created girls, women, females in amazing ways. I mean, just the miracle of the human body. This is true for all of us. But he's created us all, male or female. Um, and, but from a time that a girl is young, you start to walk through a lot of changes. We all go through puberty. But, uh, but girls will then enter into this um, monthly cycle that can often be a real, a uh, lot of hormonal changes. Uh, it can be a real challenging time. Uh, it's often painful. Um, and then some of you women have walked through uh, pregnancy. Um, you, you talk about dramatic change in the, in the body of, of a woman. It's a miraculous change. Some of you uh, have, have lost babies, whether it's in the womb or, or after they've been born. I have done some uh, just heartbreaking funerals through the years. And some of you are here today. But those of you who have walked through pregnancy, you go through nine months with this child. And again, your body changing really forever. And then you're rewarded with sleepless nights. Um, uh, go through labor, uh, which is another thing. And then you're rewarded with sleepless nights, persevering be- up through feedings and things that no one will ever see. And just the heroic things that women do, whether moms or not moms. And no man will ever come up to you and say he is as much a woman as you are. It's insanity. God has created us male and female. And his word tells us so. We need to decide as his people whether we're going to listen to the whims of culture and we're going to follow after our own personal desires or we're going to see what God desires for us and if it goes against what we desire, we will align our desires with his desires. This is the Christian life. I mean, this goes way beyond sexuality or gender orientation. This is what we're going to see. How do you live like this? Hannah will show us the way. And we're going to look at a passage of Scripture. We're not in the Psalms this week. Many of you know we've been through this series, Real real Life, how to get through what you're going through. We've talked about mental um, illness, you know, really depression, anxiety. We've talked about uh, indifference. We've talked about exhaustion because that happens in our spiritual lives. Last week we talked about comparison, an incredible sermon that Rodney brought on comparison. Today we're going to look at crisis. And 
Crisis, I discovered this this week. Crisis is actually a medical term, med- medical term. If you look at the etymology of the word, it actually is a medical term where you have to make a decision in a moment that could be life or death. And we've come to understand crisis, right, as an t- intense moment where you really have to decide something. And today we're going to talk about a crisis. We all go through crises. But uh, I, was with a, I was with a group of women. While you're turning there, 1 Samuel is where we're going to be. I was with a group of women, uh, 100 plus women in our great hall last Saturday because we, we partner with a, a ministry called Thrive uh, where it helps women navigate hard decisions around unexpected pregnancy and then advocates for them and helps them give birth to those children. And I was with a group of, we had several hundred women, uh, I mean families, but women who were there because they chose life. And we had a luncheon for them. We had pictures for them, Mother's Day pictures for free. And uh, it was just an amazing time. And through your giving, Rodney noted earlier, so many good things are happening. And you're a part of that. Oftentimes we watch the news and wonder, how can I, how can I make a difference? Your, your giving to our, our church makes a difference. Because of Thrive Ministries and other partnerships we have with those who, who seek to bring life and release, remove all the options that women would have to think they must have an abortion. And so I'm so thankful that we're part of a church that does so. And by the way, a little footnote here. Um, we have a member of our church, Dr. Katie McCoy, uh, who is the women's director at the Texas Baptist uh, here for our state. She's written a book called To Be a Woman. If you want to make a note, it's, you can pre-order the book on Amazon. I've done so. I've read the book and then endorsed the book. But Katie, she has a PhD, and she answers all the questions that we're facing in our culture today. And it's called To Be a Woman. And she addresses all the craziness that we're seeing in a culture that can't even define what a woman is anymore. And God's Word tells us, and today we're going to look at arguably one of the most amazing women in all of Scripture. Perhaps the most devoted woman in the Old, Old Testament. And so I want you to, to look at this with me. You know, crisis, again, we're going to talk about crisis. We all go through crises, right? We talk about a medical crisis. We talk about a financial crisis. Maybe you're going through one now, or a, vo, a vo, vocational crisis, relational crisis. Because here's what happens. Crisis will bring about a crisis of faith. And that's what we're going to see today. Whatever you're going through, because the worst thing about crisis is that, it, that things feel so chaotic. They don't seem to make sense in the moment of crisis. And so in 1 Samuel, we see the story of Hannah. And I want to give you some context here because I'm going to spend a lot of time setting up this song that we just now, Heather just read for us, the lyrics of this song. And I'm going to to take some time to see how in the world can this woman sing this song um, in such a powerful song. Hannah lived just prior to David, so right around uh, 1000 B.C. She ends up being, uh, spoiler alert, the, the mother of Samuel, who is the one who anoints, he, he's a prophet, who anoints Saul, the first king of Israel, and David, the second king. And so he is this, this bridging the gap. But she is the woman of faith who bridges the gap between the judges and then uh, the period of kings. All right, so, and then to the golden era of David's uh, kingship. Hannah is arguably, again, the most devout woman in the entire Old Testament. And I want you to see three things. If you take notes on sermons, you have space in your bulletin there or in a journal you may have brought with you. Three things I want you to see. Three things God can do in a crisis. All right? Here's what he does in crisis. He reorients our affections. Secondly, he reverses our afflictions. And then finally, crises reveals our rescuer. All right? So first, crisis reorients our affections. In chapter 1, of 1 Samuel. I hope you open your Bible, by the way, everybody. I'm not showing you all the scripture here throughout our time together. Open your Bible and turn there with me. 1 Samuel chapter 1. All right. So uh, we're introduced to a man named Elkanah. All right. Elkanah has two wives. First, one is Hannah, the other is Peninnah. And it says in verse 4 on the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. Now, immediately we got a couple of questions. What's up with two wives, right? 
I'll speak to polygamy here in a moment. The other is, what's up with God closing her womb? This, it says it twice here. This is only here, as far as I know in scripture, where we see this. Um, this is a sign. This is a sign for the reader to say something's going on here. God is up to something. We know something Hannah doesn't know. Now, she'll reveal that she does know. God is always up to something. But God is up to something here, and yet she hasn't seen it. And then Elkanah, who's a godly man, loves Hannah greatly. In fact, the language is such here, and his actions reveal, she's having my children, Peninnah, but you're my true love. And to make matters a bit crazier, look at verse 6. And her rival, this is Benina, used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year, out, year by year, this infertility for Hannah and for Elkanah. Don't miss this. Men go through infertility as well. Husbands. Year after year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she had to deal with this. She, was, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. Okay, so Hannah is sad for, and grieving for two reasons. One, she's in a polygamous marriage. That is one of the reasons. Now, people might say, they look at Scripture and they go, Hey, you know, um, hey, polygamy's in the Bible. It must be okay. Uh, that's what the Mormons thought until 1882 when the Polygamous Act was, in, was, was put into action. And suddenly their doctrine changes because they're afraid of what may happen with federal government coming after them or the destruction of their temples or whatever else. But scripture here is not, it's not descriptive. Or, or how about this? It's not prescriptive. It's descriptive. In other words, this is describing what took place. It's not prescribing the way it should go. And every time you see polygamous marriages in the Bible, it is a train wreck. And Hannah's in a dysfunctional marriage as a result. But again, Elkin is a good man and loves her. And uh, don't miss this. Uh, he, he, he loves her greatly, but she's still grieving and walking through challenges here. The second reason that she's undone is because she's not living up to cultural expectations. She's not living up to the cultural norm. To have a child in this culture was to be like a cultural hero. Think about it. Your family, uh, your, your business, um, financially. You could say even your security, safety. So you, you could say economically, um, gosh, culturally, militarily, uh, all the things. You, we see that in every way this could be a cultural good. And you might be thinking, wow, what an oppressive culture that must have been. And it was in many ways. But think about this. Every culture has ideals that we're challenged to live up to, that we're, we're challenged to, to live out, right? And, and, and let me ask you this. Are, are there cultural ideals that are placed on women today? Wow. In every way. Every culture, how about this, has rivals. Every culture has peninnas. Our culture has them. Women are challenged to live up to all kinds of expectations. Enormous pressure is put on women and men. And we all can learn from Hannah here to watch how this story plays out. But think about it. Our looks, our clothing, our body type, our profession. If you're, if you're single, I hope you're killing it in your profession. And maybe you'll get married someday. As if a man is going to fulfill all that you need in life. I sit with young couples who are getting married. And, and I'll hear, you know, why do you want to get married? And there's this, in essence, because I love him. And he is so, loves me so much. You know, and all the things. And, and I've realized you're trying, you're going to, you think, this guy? You think he's going to, like, fulfill all these needs that you have? It's not going to happen. Nor will it happen for women um, in, in a man's life. And, and then married women, you're, okay, now have, have kids. And then, okay, have kids. Now be a super mom. And if you can balance profession or a side hustle and all the kids, then you're really, look, all of us are, 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 are tempted to be sucked into cultural expectations. And Hannah did not fit 
and she's distraught. She is at a crisis point. What is a woman to do? Well, if you follow after cultural expectations, it's going to be, okay, act like this, look like this, say this, and do this, and do this, and don't do this, and do this, right? But all of us face this. What, what happens when so many women and men, but women go through anxiety, depression, we've talked a lot about lately, self-harm, eating disorders. What's all that about? That's about trying to live up to cultural expectations, right? Let's press into this. Hannah is listening to two voices, or she's faced to hear two voices. One is Peninnah, who represents cultural expectations. The other is her husband. Look at verse 8. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart so sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? Notice he doesn't answer because we all know the answer. (laughs) Right? Robert Alter, I mean as much as he loved her, and he did. Robert Alter, a a renowned Hebrew scholar, notes that Hannah doesn't answer either voice. She says nothing. The only person she talks to in this entire passage is Eli, the priest. She doesn't answer Peninnah, representing cultural expectations. She doesn't doesn't answer her husband, representing male love or affection in her life. And the Hebrew narrative, here's what it means. It means that she is not building her life on cultural ideals or expectations or on the love of a man. Because we've all seen women who do this. We see women who place their, their identity and their worth in their children. And you do one or two things. You'll, you will crush that child. Or you will be crushed. Through unmet expectations. And we've all seen women who have run after men seeking to find their identity. But our boys do the same. We teach our boys, hey, big boys don't cry. Be the man. Do all the things. Be successful. Make the money, whatever it is. Climb the cultural ladder. We all have expectations that are placed on us. And if we're not careful, we will be sucked in to those expectations and the joy Life, purpose, meaning will be sucked out of our lives as well. And our strength will be sucked out of our lives. So what are we to do? The first thing Hannah does, she rejects those voices. The first thing she does is reject those voices. We, we, we can allow crisis, watch this, to reorient our faith away from cultural expectations and what everybody's saying to us or we will listen to the voice of God and find our identity and our worth and be satisfied in him alone. Look at verse 9. What does Hannah do? After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. Now, catch this, another Hebrew idiom. She stood up. She got up. You say, well, you know, why is that there? Again, scholars know the Hebrew language is such. Of course she got up. Like she was sitting, eating, she got up and started walking away. No, 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 no. What's going on here? We, We have idioms like this. Our idiom would be she put her foot down. She decided I'm not playing this game anymore. This means she took charge. No more. Will I believe the lies of others coming at me that I have to live up to cultural expectations or find my worth in the love of a man? I will, though she's married, I will not do this. I am more than that. And don't miss this. As single women, I mean, even her as a single woman, all these families, Peninnah's going up to worship the Lord She's right there with him. And I know this is true. 
Not just on many Sundays, but on this day. Mother's Day can be the hardest day for some of us to come to worship. It's why some women aren't here today. And why we have a lot of mixed emotions on this day. But I affirm every woman, every girl that's here today. We have many, some of your widows, you've lost a husband. You've lost children. Or your children are estranged from you. Or they're not here. The path of the family didn't go like you thought it would be. Listen, you, like Hannah, has chosen. I will worship the Lord my God. I will not withhold my worship from him. I will not forsake him. She shows up at worship. She comes to the temple because that's where you worship God. And then she prays. Look at verse 10. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. Now look at this. Her circumstances haven't changed. Her grief hasn't changed. But she knows her God hasn't changed either. She comes, don't miss this, she comes honest. She comes broken. She comes determined before God. Because listen, don't miss this, friends. Faith and grief can coexist. In fact, they often do. The most powerful prayers that we pray are prayers of anguish, crying out to God in the midst of our grief. And I know this is true. We often say it at a gravesite or at a funeral. There's, you know, grief is the price we pay for love. And the greater the love, the greater the grief. But here, she is coming honestly before the Lord. Look at verse 11. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, If you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me, not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son. Look, she's saying, I really do. She's expressed, and we've been told, you share with God what you desire. Then I will give him to the Lord all the days of my life and no razor shall touch his head. Now, at first glance, this looks like she's bargaining with God. Like some of us are going, oh, I know how this plays out. Then the story goes, she's pleading with God. She gets a son. This is not what she's doing. And we know this because of what happens next. The key is no razor will touch his head. Now, y'all know I'm not a Nazarite, but that's what's happening here. (laughs) What's happened here is she's giving her son over as a Nazarite. And here's what we know about this. There is no cultural benefit for her whatsoever to have a son and to give it to the Lord as a Nazarite. Because a Nazarite could not own land. He could not inherit land. He would not live with her. She might see him once or twice a year. He wouldn't grow up in her hometown. He wouldn't be the hometown hero. He wouldn't be the sports legend. She would find no benefit from having a son and giving him over as a Nazareth. What woman has a child and gives them over to God? A woman like Hannah and like a lot of women who are here today. How does this happen? Her crisis reorients her faith. She's now saying, don't miss this, friends, listen. Lord, all my life I've wanted a son for me. Now I want one for you. Even further, if I had a son for me, I will crush him. If I find my identity in my son, in my daughter, in my child, I will crush them. If I seek to find my worth apart from you, but in children, then I will be a mess. Friends, do not do it. Don't do it to your children. Don't do it to yourself. Because I've seen many parents who have made their children out to be their savior, a kind of idol. And if you're thinking, Jeff, wow, that's a stretch. I mean, really, who makes their children an idol? Every one of us are tempted to do so. To seek our final and ultimate worth in our children. Hannah comes to this, Lord, I want you. And parents, listen, when you come to that point, God, you're enough for me. Now you're ready to parent your children. Because you're not finding your worth in them. Now I want a child for you. She stood up. This woman is amazing. 
with great resolve. I am not giving anyone power over me. I'm not grounding myself in cultural expectations or in male love around me. I am not giving my identity over to anyone but God Almighty. This is where Hannah is. And this is where she starts to pray. And you might know this part of the passage, almost humorous. She's praying, she's not, she's, you know, her lips are moving and nothing's coming out of her mouth, you know, this part. And Eli rebukes her for being drunk, okay? Now, this is Eli, he's the priest. He ought to know something about prayer, don't you think? Like maybe she's praying. And she says, I'm not drunk. I'm pouring my heart out to God. And then Eli answered her in verse 17. Go in peace and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate and her face was no longer sad. Now this is another Hebrew idiom. She's no longer long faced. This is what is happening. Her countenance on the outside, this is what this means, has been determined by her heart on the inside. It's coming out, and then it says, it goes on that she worshiped the Lord. They went to the house of Ramah, and then Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, verse 20, Hannah conceived, and due time, nine months, and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. Shavael is what it seems that word is. It's a God heard, God hears. God heard me. See, if she had been bargaining with the Lord, here's how this would have played out. Prayer, pregnancy, peace. That's not what happens. She doesn't know the answer to the prayer. Prayer, peace. Pregnancy happens to come. Our peace is found in coming to him and defining our worth and our value through him. So crisis reorients our affections. I told you I'd spend a lot of time on this first point. And now the next two. Crisis reverses our affliction. Now we get to the song. Look at chapter 2 verse 1. And Hannah prayed and said, my heart exalts. Okay, it rejoices in the Lord. For my horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in, in your salvation. Now look at this, my heart. This is the epicenter of all of life. This is the will. This is the mind. This is the affection. All of my affections. My affections are found in you. And her joy is not found in her circumstances. That's the point here. Her joy is found, check it out, in the Lord. And she's not sticking it to Penina either because she's not playing that game anymore she's done with that she's not gonna play that game her joy is in your salvation she says she's come to the Lord she has found her joy her triumph is in him God is incomparable and then listen to this prayer which says nothing about Samuel by the way because something bigger is going on than a baby being born. Look at verse two. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. And she's speaking to herself as much as anyone. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. She's saying, he's the ultimate judge. He's the one. He judges the heart, single, married, young or old, male or female. And then God reverses the order of things. He flips, watch this in verse 4 and 5. He flips the notions of human achievement upside down. In verse 4, the bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has born born seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. What's she saying there? Seven is is satisfaction. It's the number of completion. See, crisis often makes right those things that are wrong. That's what she's seeing here. Even the crisis of childbirth, think about that on this day reverses the untenable state of a baby being inside the mom forever. Every pregnancy is a crisis, if you will. 
Because out of crisis, we see life. And that's what God is doing in your life right now. She references seven. She's saying it's not the number of kids you have. It's not the number in your bank account. It's not the number of successes you have. Many likes you have on social media. She says, no, God is the one who determines all these things. And see, here's what's happening too. She's gotten outside of herself. Can you see this? She's talking about what God is doing in the world. Because we talk a lot about wellness. We've talked about this in recent days. We talk a lot about wellness and we think this. Well, it's all focused on us. If I'm well, then everything's well. If I'm well, then everybody else is well. That's not what Hannah's doing here. Because when we start to worship God, we start to see the long view of life and what he is up to in the world. God throws this woman into a crisis, but he then, watch this, he delivers her out of crisis. And you can say, well, yeah, she had a son. That's not the biggest thing going on here. So that he can deliver us from our affliction and our crisis as well. He reminds us who he is. Look at this. Charles Spurgeon said this. The Lord's mercy often rides to the door of our heart on the black horse of affliction. Matthew Henry, the famed Bible commentary, he wrote this. Extraordinary afflictions are not always the punishment of extraordinary sins, but sometimes the trial of extraordinary graces. If Hannah had a life verse in the Old Testament, it would have been Job 13, 15. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Because he is up to something in the world that goes way beyond me. And I need to get involved in what he is doing. You see, every crisis you face, friends, every crisis that you turn over to God, and every crisis he has victory over, and he does, every crisis, it's like a bell. It's like a proclamation. It's like a trumpet call that the kingdom is coming. Things will not always be the way they are. That's what Hannah's talking about. Sin, death, evil will not win. God will win the day. And each crisis conquered is a reminder that his grace, his mercy, his power, his love is victorious overall. And that tells us exactly how we should respond when we walk through crisis ourselves. We have to get our mind off of our own crisis and start overturning the crises of others. That's what we need to do. Lazy Eli, he's a horrible priest, by the way, has two rotten sons, if you know the story at all. He will be replaced by Samuel. Half-hearted Saul will be replaced by a humble shepherd boy named David. You see, this book is an entire book of reversals. The entire Bible is a book of reversals. The entire redemptive story is a story of, re of, re of reversals. Little David slays mighty Goliath. God is telling us this is how he works. This is how he operates. This is who he is. Sarah, Sarah, the old and infertile woman, is the mother of God's people. Jacob, the younger, is the child of promise, not the stronger Esau. An enslaved nation of Israel leaves and pillages a world superpower in Egypt. A small army walks around the walls of a city and is brought to its knees because of their faith. On and on it goes. And in your life. And in mine. Hang on. Because God is at work. But how does all this happen? We'll close with this. Crisis reveals our rescuer. God wants to make himself great in our crises. Hannah sees a pattern, but watch this. The pattern points to a person. In verse 6, the Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and he raises up. Now she's next level. She's talking about resurrection now. And that's not a part of Jewish theology or eschatology. Not, not clearly. Verse 7, the Lord makes 
poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts up the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and on them he has set the world. This sounds like another song. Have you caught it yet? Verse 9. He will guard the feet of the faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken into pieces against them. He will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. That word literally is Messiah. The anointed one. She sees a pattern here that points to a person. Now some would say, well, she's pointing to David. He's about to come. He's going to be the king. He's the one. Is that all she sees? This song sounds familiar, doesn't it? Centuries later, another young woman would find herself unexpectedly pregnant. And in Luke 1, she sings, my soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he's been mindful of the humble state of his servant. He's brought down rulers from their thrones and he has lifted up the humble. And he has filled the hungry with good things. He sent the rich away empty. This is the Magnificat. Mary's pregnant with the Savior of the world. He's coming. And he fulfills the pattern that we see. He's born into a poor family. He suffers. He's a man of sorrows. He becomes weak for us. He's punished as the perfect lamb. He goes to the cross so that we don't have to. Those who deserve punishment, he takes it on. He's flipping everything upside down and he's doing it in our lives right now. Not for the proud. The first step in coming to Christ is to realize your salvation is not based on how good you are. Not based on your position or power or finances. But not on your righteousness. But based on his righteousness. And all you must do is fall on your knees before him and trust in him. As Hannah has done. What will you do? What is he calling you to do today? What cultural pressures do you need to say, no, not anymore. I will live for the Lord and for him alone. Because here's the thing, friends, single, married, divorced, children, no children, young or old. None of this matters if you don't have Hannah's song in your heart. And you don't see that God's up to something great in the world. We often are wondering, what's God's will for my life? There's a better question before that question. What is God's will? What is he doing in the world? Join him. Are you joining him? Are you pursuing him? What is he telling you to do today? Crisis is an opportunity for faith. And today, perhaps the greatest crisis in your life is that you are hell bound apart from Jesus. That's the great crisis of every human born. And if you've never received him today, today is your day to receive the anointed one. God, your Savior. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your grace today. And I pray for every person here, Lord, all of us who need to make decisions. Let us not leave this holy moment in time, a moment in in a lifetime, where we will decide to follow you and serve you all the days of our lives. Lord, we give you our lives. And friend, if you're here and you've never received Christ, just say, Lord, come into my heart. I'm sorry. I've sought to build my life on my own righteousness, my own works. Lord, thank you that we are justified by your work already accomplished, not by our own. And we give you our lives today, every single one of us. And Lord, we praise you that you are enough for us. In your name we pray. Amen.